Welcome clients and friends to our afternoon webinar, Building and Protecting Wealth During a Recession. We're excited to have you here today to discuss the current economic climate, how you can build wealth during this upcoming recession, and the emerging opportunities in the real estate market. Thanks for sharing your time with us today, and um, hopefully you enjoy. We're thrilled to have Steve Soretsky and Ryan O'Hearn as our guests today. Steve is a thought leader and an author of Vancouver's uh, one of Vancouver's most popular real estate blogs. And uh, Ryan is a fellow SFU alumni uh, who I've worked with, and um, he's been in the real estate business since 2018 with his family. I val value both of their opinions, and I'm confident that uh, today we'll be able to provide you with some value to help with your own personal financial planning. So um, there's a lot of news about inflation, high interest rates, and how that's going to affect uh, real estate investments and our wallets. Today, we're going to share some data, opinions, and some strategies for you to consider during this economic climate. Please keep in mind that the purpose of this event is for education, and everyone's situation is unique, so it's important to speak with qualified advisors before making your own investment decisions. Now, for existing clients on the call, you may have seen this chart recently, as I've been talking about it quite a bit. It's showing you how interest rates have changed in Canada over the last 30 years. As we know, asset prices such as real estate and stocks went up quite a lot during the pandemic. And when you increase the money supply, there's, there's a fixed number of assets. Prices, of course, are going to go up. That's simple supply and demand. What wasn't clear at the time was just how aggressively central bankers would be increasing rates after the debt buffet of 2021. Starting in Feb 2022, we saw that the uh, rate, rate of change uh, was the highest on record. Um, from interest rates, for interest rate perspective. So those with variable rate mortgages or any sort of variable debt are feeling the pinch today. Those with fixed rate mortgages, you're going to enjoy those uh, low payments, but of course be aware that uh, whenever your renewal date comes up, that's going to potentially be an issue for you. So you'll want to plan for that. The Bank of Canada's objective has been to maintain a 2% inflation rate. As we know, cheap money that printed caused inflation to run as high as 8.1% in June of last year. Part of this likely uh, caused by corporations profiteering, but largely there were just too many dollars chasing too few goods. Inflation's coming down, and as long as it continues to, rates not need, may not need to go much higher than they presently are. Stock market reacts quickly to changes in the economy. We've been through a Great Depression, two world wars, a Cold War, the tech bubble, uh, great financial crisis. We made through all these things and, and profitable companies continue to make money. So however, th that rational exuberance that we saw during the pandemic, where we saw unprofitable companies receiving insane amounts of funding, this recession is likely going to clean out a lot of those companies that didn't really have business models to begin with. So when you look at your portfolio and it's down, obviously it doesn't feel great. However, consider the underlying principles of the companies in your portfolio. Are they still making money? Will they continue to make money from here? Overall, the market is efficient and optimists tend to win long term. We'll discuss strategy shortly, but for now, I'll pass the floor over to Mr. Steve Soretsky. Thanks for having me on here. So basically, I just want to give you guys a sort of overview context of really what's happening, sort of like from the larger, bigger picture. Ryan will kind of get into maybe some of the micro uh, analysis in the Vancouver housing market here, but um, I think it's you know important to to sort of put into context um, you know how things played out over the last couple of years. Obviously, you had a huge boom during the pandemic. A lot of that was fueled by, as Brandon said, you know, a huge movement up in the money supply. Of course, that was helped or aided by ultra low mortgage rates. So mortgage rates went from the lows of about 1.2%. You know, we had clients locking in five-year fixed mortgages at about 1.3%. Um, variables were very common to be picked up around 1.2. And, you know, here we are today, uh, five point, you know, we're at about 5% on your five-year fixed rate mortgage today. Uh, your variable rate mortgage is getting close to 6%. So that's made a huge sudden shock in the housing market, something we haven't seen. We haven't seen these rates in over a decade. So, you know, one of the things I like to kind of point out is everyone's saying, okay, well now what, you know, we've had this sudden shock in housing, the huge movement, you know, 400 basis points of rate hikes in less than a year. Uh, so we're getting, you know, fixed payment variables, which was a product um, that ultimately wasn't designed in this kind of market. 
And, and so people are suddenly, you know, that when we're going variable are basically in a situation where their payments have gone up tremendously. And so what they're opting to do is leave the payments the same and basically allow their balance of the mortgage to continue to grow. Uh, so essentially banks are extending and pretending. So here we can see the proportion of mortgages with amortizations that are longer than 30 years. Uh, you've got BMO with 32%, CIBC with 30, TD by 29, RBC by 25. So what that basically means in simple terms, it means that people's amortizations are actually growing and their balances of their mortgages are essentially not declining. So basically all of their monthly payment is going towards interest only. So these mortgages have become interest only loans. And in some cases, they're actually negative amortizing, which means that the, the monthly payment isn't covering all of the interest that's outstanding. And so the balances of, the, at, at, of some of these loans are actually growing. And so this is fine so long as you can kick the can down the road a couple of years. But at some point, people are going to be faced with these balloon payment shocks, which is when you go to renew after five years, you have to fit that remaining balance of your mortgage within the remaining amortization. So for example, you took out a 30-year amortization and in five years, there's 25 years left. You have to fit whatever of whatever is left on the balance. You have to now fit that under 25 years, unless you have the ability to refinance and bring it back down to 30 years. However, in order to refinance, you must pass a stress test, which is now about seven and a half percent. So most, a lot of people aren't going to be able to do that. So the short answer here is the banks are allowing people to sort of extend the banks are basically don't want your house, which is their collateral on the housing market and flooding it with inventory. And so they're allowing people that otherwise would be stressed out, would probably be selling their houses. They're allowing them to basically defer um, their, their payments. So this is allowing people to extend and pretend. That's why we see very little inventory in today's housing market. So all the media talk, all the speculation around, you know, distress people, interest rates going up. There's going to be a wave of these foreclosures hitting the market. We, we, haven't, we haven't seen that. In fact, we've seen the complete opposite um, because people basically have not been in, in a bind to actually sell. Uh, so here we can see active uh, inventories across the nation uh, are at some of the lowest levels we've seen in the last several decades. So if you look here in Greater Vancouver, um, we have a 26-year low in new listings for Greater Vancouver. So again, imagine you know, you're know you in November, December, the market's looking pretty grim. Interest rates are up. We don't know when they're going to stop going up. People are obviously worried about the economic outlook. The, the rationale was, oh, surely there's going to be a wave of people that aren't going to be able to afford their payments and they're gonna flood the housing market. And the opposite again has actually happened so far this year in 2023, 26 year lows in greater Vancouver. In fact, we had 20 year lows uh, for the month of February across the country. So it's not just in Vancouver, but this is a countrywide phenomenon. So multiple, what this is actually doing, funny enough is multiple offers have returned for some product. So if you're looking for an entry-level house today, if you're looking for an entry-level townhouse in most pockets of the market, because of a 20-year low in new listings, not adjusted for population growth, um, the, the inventory picture is incredibly bad. And so the, the people that are out there that are buying, people that need to get on with their lives, young families, people that are up, need to upsize, people relocating for work, people that need to buy they're running into basically a brick wall, which is there's no inventory. And so what's happening is you're getting 30, 40, 50 people showing up at the same open house and multiple offers have returned again for some product. I should underline that. So yeah, if you look at detached houses, this is where we're seeing the most um, strength in the housing market. So detached houses under $2 million are back down to three months of supply on market. Um, lots of multiple offers happening in that segment. Prices, you're actually paying more today for a house than you were four to six months ago. So interest rates are pretty much, you know, mortgage rates are relatively unchanged over the last six months. You're, but you're paying more today than you were four to six months ago for the same house. That's just the reality because there's no inventory. So despite the economic sort of macro fundamentals that Brandon has highlighted and that, you know, part of I have highlighted as well, um, the inventory picture is kind of trumping all of that noise right now. So basically... There's a couple things to watch if you want to sort of try to get a, a better sense of where the housing market may or may not go. Um, 
the, the ultimate micro stuff is new listings and active inventory for sale. All you have to do is look at months of inventory, look at those charts. Um, those will tell you where the housing market's going to go. So anytime you get around, you know, two, three, four months of inventory, typically speaking, you see upwards pressure on prices. So despite what's happening and all the news and the media and, and, you know, banks blowing up and this and that, like if you have under three months of inventory, chances are you're still going to see higher prices. Now, again, that could change if we get some of these mortgage deferrals starting to back up, you get some job losses, you get more inventory that's distressed, that's comes into market, that could start to change the inventory picture. So you have to watch that. And then, of course, the Canada five-year bond yield, uh, which is basically is what prices your five-year fixed rate mortgage. If you watch that, that's pretty much going to tell you where mortgage rates are going. And of course, you know, if mortgage rates fall, that's typically... Uh, bullish or optimistic for house prices. So we've seen um, over the last two weeks, the volatility in the bond market has been extreme. You've seen that Canada five-year bond drop by about 70 to 80 basis points in two weeks. Um, so we haven't quite seen banks discount mortgage rates yet, but that is coming. Uh, so right now you're still at about 5%. If these rates hold, these bond yields hold, you should see mortgage rates come back into the mid fours. Uh, in the coming month or two. Awesome. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, yeah, certainly an uh, interesting market. I think we didn't expect to see uh, multiple offers when rates are potentially four times more than they were a year ago, but uh, here we are. Um, I'd now like to pass the floor over to Mr. Ryan O'Hearn. Uh, Ryan's going to share with us some uh, boots on the ground um, data that's going to be relevant for some of your decision making. Over to you, Ryan. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate you having us on here uh, to just chat with everyone about the upcoming, uh, yeah, potential recession and market climate. Feels like we're in university again, wearing uh, uh, back in those days. So, so it's fun. Uh, so, yeah, so just a bit of a landscape here. Um, as the market progresses through different stages, um, there's different factors to consider. Uh, first one here, we do, well, if we slide over to the slump phase, which is likely what, what we're in right now, uh, we do see property prices are down. New construction is on a relative high as developers do need to continue releasing product. Rental rates have not continued going up. They've actually plateaued from September as we've seen. As we've seen. So we're not really seeing a raise in rental rates. Uh, but the two factors we wanna focus on here, especially in a recession are the vacancy rates and the property inventory. Uh, we haven't quite, as Steve was alluding to, we haven't quite seen the property inventory go up uh, due to the factors that he's mentioned. Uh, but if we do see a recession come in and jobs are come, kind of being lost, layoffs are coming into effect, uh, property inventory is directly correlated with that as well. So we could see this uptick, as he was mentioning, in addition to vacancy rates. So considering the vacancy rates and the risk uh, that comes in with that, uh, we really want to go back to basics here when buying. So location is super key. Uh, you hear the cliche all the time, location, location, location. But I mean, it, it's true. Uh, we're looking at things that won't really go away in a recession. And those, those industries are hospitals and healthcare, uh, our education sector with universities. Um, another a great kind of pivot would be student housing. Um, interestingly, if you think about it, as a recession happens, people get laid off. A lot of individuals might decide to go back to school and do their studying. So uh, going to perhaps a, whether it's a formal student housing arrangement, or maybe it's a condominium near university, those are super important and you're going to have lower vacancy rates in these industries here. Um, business centers and any urban center where someone is working is going to be quite important. Uh, you just want a place where people, worst case scenario, they want to be close to work. They don't want to drive, no, less gas money. You got to think in terms of location where they want to live, which is often where they work. So these are quite important to consider. Uh, middle of the road properties are great as well. Um, you know, certain, certain cities such as maybe the Tri-Cities in New West, these are very central to a lot of different areas. Um, they're not quite high end in terms of price point. Uh, what I want to mention too in the stats we're looking at last month in February 2023, 79% um, 70, of listings um, that sold last month were under $1.5 million. So as Steve says, with that downward compression, of demand, people are having to buy down, buy cheaper. And we've even seen multiple offers with families wanting to cram like four or five people in a two bed condo or rental. They wanna, it's a, such a demand for rental that people are making it work. So what we're seeing is a downward compression. So you kind of want to get those middle of the road properties. There's always gonna be demand for a one or two bedroom or three bedroom condo. It's very hard to kind of take away that demand. 
Um, next year, we have strong, robust cash flow uh, just to fight against rising interest rates if they do go up more. Hopefully not. But if they do, uh, you want to make sure you have a strong cash flow source. Um, just like a business, you want to have that cash flow protect you and pay off those payments. Um, and finally, transit oriented developments, uh, kind of to the first point, somewhere that people can take the train to work. If they don't want to drive or want to sell their car, hey, I'll take the train to work. Uh, this is always a great, great kind of factors to consider when buying. Uh, we recommend staying away um, with recessions. Often what gets hit hard is recreational properties. Uh, this could just because discretionary spending It's people don't have enough ca as much cash to buy what they want. So in terms of extra extracurricular uh, properties, so you want to avoid uh, recreational stuff. Um, single industry towns are also a bit of a risk. If the one mill in town gets uh, shut down and those jobs are lost, uh, you're going to have a lot of vacancy hitting that town and it's going to be hard to get, get it re-rented. Uh, luxury product. Again, to the last slide, uh, it is it is tougher to resell in a recession, and you, you might see a bigger decline in the in this space here. And finally, anything speculative, you want to avoid that as well. So, if you don't have a clear exit strategy when acquiring a property, um, such as maybe vacant land, it, it's probably not the best idea to buy unless you have cash and you don't care about interest payments. Uh, you want to buy something with some cash flow that can service that debt, and you want to know how that debt, how you can basically pivot with those uh, with that property and make sure that you get your cash flow or you can sell it off at a profit or at least make sure you're not going to lose money on it. Um, some strategies for 2023. Um, that's the good old buy and hold. Uh, I mean, it, you hear realtors say it all the time. There's never a bad time to buy. And uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're buying with a long term outlook, uh, you're, you're really it's Vancouver. Uh, we have, a hundred, you know, 400,000 people come to Canada, 100,000 to BC, 60,000 to the lower mainland you're going to do well in the long term just because the, there's a lot of great fundamentals with, with Vancouver that's made it a place people want to move to for the last 30 years and for the next 30 years to continue. Uh, you mean, if, so if you're looking at something three years plus or even five years plus, we like five years are probably a better window, but at least three years at very minimum, uh, you, you'll do okay. Um, foreclosures, uh, we, yeah, we haven't seen this too, too much just yet, but if people do lose jobs, uh, unfortunately, that might be something that might happen where in ca these cases here, uh, you might look at some foreclosures to basically purchase a property and that could be an option down the road here. Um, Pre-sales, uh, you're seeing a lot of developers right now offering some really great incentives. Uh, this could be a lower deposit, perhaps a 10% deposit structure. Uh, some, just, some developers are offering $50,000 off, $100,000 debt creating credits. So you want basically to get something where you can pre-negotiate uh, a great deal where you're building in that cushion. And uh, what I like to say, again, is that long-term outlook, because you don't really want something completing next year in a sense, because if the economy is in a worse off place, uh, that is not really a great option to be completing in that environment. Um, ideally, if you want to get something just as far out as possible, uh, that would really kind of hedge that risk because, again, fundamentals are there that we could argue that Vancouver is going to be a growing market in the long term. It, again, I'll, very quickly, it's, this is not really a one that is probably more in the commercial space, but you're starting to see uh, vendor take back mortgages, which is uh, basically a seller saying, hey, I, the buyer saying, hey, I can't get a mortgage right now, but I see the value in your property. Um, I need a few months to kind of renovate it and turn it around. Um, can you as the seller give me the mortgage? Seller will give a temporary mortgage while you fix it up. And you go back to the bank later, which ideally when rates come down at some point here, you can take it to an institutional lender. Um, but that's probably more of a kind of commercial play. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on that. So best practices buying and selling. Um, with selling, uh, you want to make sure your property stands out. There's about one in 10 or two, two in 10 properties are selling. You want to make sure you're in that group. Uh, so that means really taking the time to stage it, make it look nice, declutter your property if you're selling, take the professional photos, fix little gimmicks that are not working because these are the things that, that as inventory grows, uh, you want to make sure your property stands out of the bunch. Um, in general, properties that are not kept or have you know, fixer uppers, these are not the properties that, that actually, you get a bit more discount. You're going to get hit harder in, a, in an environment with more inventory if your property is not kind of a 10 out of 10. Um, as, as Steve was mentioning, we're seeing multiple offers. If the property is priced well and it looks good, you're getting three, four, five, six offers still. So you want to make sure you're that, that property, which means pricing it well and making sure you take care of the small stuff. Um, buying a property, so switch over to the other side here. 
you don't really want to necessarily leverage to the max right now. Uh, if you can uh, potentially put a 40 to 60% down payment with cash and get a 40% mortgage, that is much better because again, if rates continue to go up a little bit more, which there's always, a, there is a risk of that. Uh, you don't really want to get caught in that, uh, caught in that kind of crunch there. Um, and when buying right now, as inventory grows, it's almost not that you want to buy anything. You almost want to buy something where you're not going to get, you don't want to buy something you're going to regret essentially. So that means taking the time where you're doing your proper inspections and due diligence, even though it might look like a great deal, uh, really take the time to go through those, uh, those, those um, kind of due diligence and going through the documents, making sure you're buying what you actually think you're buying. Uh, don't be afraid to renegotiate. So, I mean, last week here at a client, we did an inspection. There was some stuff that needed need attention in terms of the roof for the next couple of years, hot water tank, you know, fairly simple stuff. And we, we threw on the table, we say, hey, we want uh, $10,000 off to remove subjects um, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, six, seven months ago, they would have laughed at you if you said that because it's kind of take it or leave it. But Sellers in this case said, sure, we'll, we'll sign off on it if you can remove subjects and no questions asked, they, they, they did it. So uh, I'd say don't be afraid to renegotiate if you do see something that is making you a little uncomfortable. It's just definitely the market and climate to do that. And finally here, we're looking at stink bids. Um, a bit of work for your realtor, <laughs> but uh, this is definitely a, a, a strategy that, that would work well is just put, put in the offer. Um, a lot of clients want to time the market perfectly and they want to buy right at the bottom. But unfortunately, no one knows what that bottom is. So what you can do as a buyer is to really build that cushion in and offer maybe 5%, 10% under market value, build that cushion in. So if the market does decrease further, you've already got that um, secured. So just put in the stink bids and maybe the seller might not take it in that moment. Maybe they think it's much too low. Uh, however, if they don't get offers in the next one, two, three, four months, guess who the first person they're going to call? It's going to be you as the buyer, since you might be the only one putting in an offer. So sometimes it doesn't hurt to put in the offer, even though it's low, and just plant those seeds around, whether that's a resale deal with something on the market or perhaps a pre-sale pre uh, with the developer. Um, these are the kind of strategies where if they call you back, you might be getting a deal of a lifetime. Uh, we Well, I think the last thing I wanted to end up on here, uh, which we want to talk about, was kind of like the window of time. So uh, I know with uh, the last two uh, re you know, recessions, we just basically had a, a between 11 to 17 month uh, time frame before we got to the bottom of the market. And right now we're sitting about that nine to 12 month window. So we, we think, uh, as the, a lot of the numbers say, that we might be approaching a bottom quite soon. Uh, but uh, what we might do here is we'll pass it over to Brandon. He's going to chat back with these the statistics of uh, kind of getting back more into the nitty gritty of the numbers and uh, pass it to you, Brandon. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Definitely some good uh, things to think about there. Uh, I know I had some clients trying to buy a property during the pandemic and it was really frustrating and they didn't get the opportunity to offer stink bids or uh, ask for changes to uh, to closing, uh, to the closing. So that's, that's awesome. Um, definitely great to have a realtor on your side to help um, navigate this market um, moving forward. As many of you on this webinar have already purchased your first home, I won't be delving too deeply into the first home savings account, which is set to be released in April 2023. This is a new type of account that offers contributors a tax deduction in the year that they make the contribution. However, if they anticipate that uh, there's a greater benefit in future tax year, they can opt to shift the deduction to that year instead. Now, unlike the RRSP or TFSA, the FHSA is a one-time use program Individuals can contribute the funds and watch them grow tax-free until they're ready to use them as a down payment. It's quite possible that the RRSP Home Buyers Plan is going to be phased out. And so in the meantime, it's possible to utilize both the FHSA and the RRSP Home Buyers Plan. Additionally, with the FHSA, uh, any funds that you don't end up using for the first time home purchase, you can transfer into your RRSP, providing you with some free contribution room. It's important to note that to be eligible for the FHSA, you must be a first-time home buyer. So this means you cannot have owned or lived in a home, you or your common law partner, for the last uh, current year and any of the previous four calendar years. Please bear in mind that as this program is rolled out, uh, the information provided here may change slightly. And so I'm not yet an expert on the FHSA. I hope this information is helpful for you. When the market's going up, leveraging can be fantastic. You can write off the interest against the investment loans or investment properties that you have, and you can magnify your gains versus simply saving on a monthly basis and investing, uh, as you can see in this chart. 
During today's economy and a rising interest rate environment, the cost of your loans are likely going up and the value of your assets are going down. For the long-term investor that has sufficient cash reserves, you're likely going to be fine. However, if you're over leveraged or levered into high risk assets such as cryptocurrencies or marijuana stocks, you're likely going to be in trouble. Now, uh, clients always are uh, wondering, well, how does this change my current financial planning? And, and frankly, it, it doesn't. The three rules of thumb that I review with every client are going to be gospel until uh, the end of time. Number one, work with advisors that you trust, people that you know have your best interest at heart and who are going to be around to support you through the ups and downs of life. Number two, maintain those emergency savings. So ensuring you've got three to six months of your expenses saved up in a rainy day fund or access to through a HELOC, that's going to ensure that even if you lost your job, got sick or something happened, you're going to be able to meet your obligations and not need to sell your investments or real estate when the market's down. And then, of course, pay yourself first. So during the good and bad times, continue to save in the most tax effective way and ensure that you're uh, increasing your savings over time as you're increasing your income. These are never going to go out of style. Now, up until last year, I didn't recommend these products, uh, high interest savings accounts. However, if you're looking to buy property, start a business or just have cash sitting around that uh, you aren't sure what you want to do with, the best high interest savings account I've been able to find is offering 4.4%. Now, this is redeemable anytime. So people say, well, why don't I just buy a GIC for five years? Frankly, if um, you are a long-term investor and you uh, have a long, high risk tolerance, you can probably do better than 5% annualized. And it's better if you don't lock your money up for that period of time, because who knows what the future is going to hold. So while it's slightly less, 4.4% uh, slightly less than five, the fact is uh, having that flexibility to pull the money out and use it for other things is, I would say, more beneficial. Now, you're not going to get rich with high interest savings accounts, but it's not a bad place to temporarily park cash until you're ready to make some moves. Now, we're going to transition into an open Q&A. If you'd like to uh, ask us any questions or expand on any of the things that we uh, spoke about today, please uh, prompt those in the, in the chat box. Now it's your chance. I'll turn the floor over to you. Um, to get us started here, uh, I'd love to just get uh, both Steve and Ryan's opinion here. Uh, what's an interesting case that came up this year that uh, you didn't think uh, could happen up until up until this year? So perhaps just an interesting client uh, purchase or sale that uh, you'd be comfortable sharing with the group. Hmm. Ryan, do you want it? On the spot. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of... Uh... The recent ones here like you're saying like what happened this year which would have not have happened in previous times like it's kind of unique to the where we're in right now yeah exactly yeah i mean I, I i think just i guess i'm still in shock of that whole addendum where we just at last minute asked for that discount it was like not even a, a for the sellers didn't even push back they just said sure if, if you remove subjects we'll give you a discount based essentially and like that has never happened i told my clients when we did it i said hey like don't be prepared. Like they might not just say yes to this. Like I, you know, I'm, I wasn't sure, but the fact that the sellers just kind of within an hour, they got texted me and said, well, the realtor texted me and said, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. If you can move subject. That to me was a shock. That's never happened to me before where they just outright just say yes so quickly. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe the listing agent was just, just want to get a deal done or, but I, I mean, in, in the past, that was, uh, so I guess I'm still kind of in shock of that. And I was really excited to get that from my clients and my, my buyers. So, yeah. Um, probably just, yeah, the return of a uh, couple subject to sale deals. Um, saw a bunch of those, still seeing them. Um, yeah, I haven't seen those, haven't seen those in years. So, I mean, there was a time there where, yeah, I think there were some really good deals negotiated in sort of late summer, early fall, um, you know, where sentiment was really negative. Um, sentiment was really negative. Yeah, people just didn't know where the bottom was going to be, how high rates were going to go. And uh, there was, yeah, a lot of a lot of scared people. And that was where I think the best deals so far anyways have been negotiated. Um, like I said uh, earlier in the call, it's interesting to think that like you're paying more today than you were four to six months ago. Yeah, I think we're all quite surprised about that. Uh, we've got a, a lady here, Sonia Fernandez. I'm going to um, allow you to, to ch uh, share your question here verbally, if you like, if you don't feel like typing it. 
I think you should be able, able to turn your mic on, Sonia, if you want to jump in. I saw your hand was up. Oh, no luck with Sonia. If you uh, change your mind, just uh, let me know. Um, okay, other question I had was foreclosures. So um, I think a lot of us thought we'd be seeing more foreclosures in the market today, considering rates are as high as they are. Now, you know, I know there's a lot of people who don't have mortgages on their homes, but, um, and we've now seen the, the increased amortization. How far along do you think until we're going to see some of these foreclosures? And have either of you transacted a foreclosed property um, before? Ryan, you want it first? I can go first. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we haven't seen like a, a big uptick in terms of foreclosure. It seems like a fairly normal amount uh, in terms of the past history there. Uh, I have offered on foreclosures. I've still yet to successfully get one personally. Um, I've also actually looked for myself too. Um, just the thing with foreclosures, once you get the accepted offer, you go through all that, you go to a court date. Um, and that gives an opportunity for anyone else to bid on that at the court date. And uh, I actually lost through, uh, from $100. I was $100 short from the, the top bidder. Uh, so we did not get that one. Um, but I, I think the foreclosure scene in Canada is very different than the U.S. Um, it, that's a perfect example that it is sometimes tough to get them. Um, but yeah, it, it, it might not happen until like... I know I hate to say it, but if, you know, recession and people do lose their jobs, there is really no, there's not really much of an option. People do either need to sell and if they can't, they can't pay for the mortgage, then um, the bank, unfortunately, would step in in that sense, in that case there. Uh, but right now we're just seeing people still have work. Um, there's a lot of demand uh, for, it's a very robust economy as we're seeing. Um, and people are able to service that debt. And like Steve was saying, but banks seem okay to be extending the amortization period. They're not clamping down hard in the immediate moment. Um, they're giving people a bit of time and space to sort it. So that's kind of fighting the, that's not really, you know, it's been kind of a, a holding out in terms of foreclosures and people having to sell their house, which, which in, for, from a societal point of view is, is probably a good thing. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the foreclosure process in like BC, for example, takes on average about 12 to 15 months. So the time that you miss your first payment to the time you're actually like selling your house in a foreclosure, it's, it's a long process, right? So the fact is, Bank of Canada started raising rates, you know, I think what they started last March. So we're not even, it's going to take time basically for foreclosures to actually filter through. Um, to Ryan's point, yeah, I've done a bunch of foreclosures, um, won some, lost some. I, I find that it's very hit or miss. Like my general rule of thumb is I think, I think you tend to get about a 5% discount for foreclosures. I, for what I find now, I just got outbid on a foreclosure three weeks ago and somebody somebody paid more than what you could have probably bought it as a normal resale. So this is the problem where it's like in these foreclosures is that you go in the new process is you go in completely blind. You have no idea how many people are actually competing because there's no more court dates. They did this whole COVID thing where everything is now online remote. So it's completely blind. And, and so it's, it's, it's always like, yeah, you can definitely get good deals and foreclosures, but you can, we also see people overpay. Yeah, I know uh, duplex I bought, the neighbor was a foreclosure and he got a hundred thousand dollars off what I paid, but his place was a mess and he probably had 20 to 30,000 of work that had to get done and probably a lot of stress. So there's certainly some trade-offs there, but if you want to save some money, you, you might get lucky and get a, get a deal. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Carlos here. With the situation in the States, do you think the Bank of Canada will consider uh, cutting rates sooner? Good question. Who wants to take it first? Uh, I mean, I'll say yes. Uh, I don't know how soon, but I think in probably this this calendar year, I think we'll probably see something. I mean, things are escalating so quickly, right? I mean, things are... The volatility in markets right now is very unpredictable. So I think we just have to expect the unexpected um you know three four or five weeks ago that would have been inconceivable and now all of a sudden you know you get some news flow and people think it's like imminent so it's interesting to see how quickly like sentiment can change and how quickly you know things can happen so i think it's you can't rule it out i think there's a fairly high probability given the uh given what's happening in 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 the world and obviously like our housing market plays an important factor and that's part of the reason why they paused um you know we what we talked about on this on this you know call was 
while prices are firming up and you're seeing multiple offers, the reality is that there's not a lot of activity, right? 20 year low in new listings, 10 year low in, in home sales. So like, that's not really great for, for the economy to have, you know, decade lows in activity. So um, yeah, we'll see how it filters through. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, it definitely would, it would create a reason for the bank Canada not to put rates up more or, you know, just stay, take the, t- the gas off of that. But I wouldn't say the Bank of Canada would leave, leave, leave the charge in terms of slashing the rates because like, yeah, I, I was just listening yesterday to economists speak and they said the problem with us cutting the rates too much, if we were to, is that if the, if the U.S. keeps their rate high, um, our dollar would fall. And the, the ironic thing with that is that any imported goods from the U.S. would be more expensive for us, which would create a cycle of inflation for us, which would make us put rates up more again. So I, I think like it definitely would, I think it's good that the feds of the down South are going to be looking at this and probably going to be less hawkish on putting rates up more. And based on that, Canada might adjust accordingly and play. So, but there, I would say that, that depending what the U S does will also have an impact of what Canada decides to do in terms of following suit or not. Uh, well, I, I definitely didn't predict that rates were going to go up 400 basis points, but uh over the last year, that was much more than I thought could 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 be possible. Uh, now, Canada is much more levered to housing compared to the U.S. The U.S. delevered quite a bit back in 2008. We didn't. Uh, we're very dependent on the housing market. So I think as, as long as the developers are um, knocking on Tip Macklin's door, there's likely going to be uh, a decrease in, in rates later this year. But once again, I don't have a crystal ball. I definitely didn't call the 400 basis point increase over the last year, but uh, ultimately we'll see what happens. Uh, okay, we got another one here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, question is, how do you guys uh, think the newly introduced flipping tax will impact the housing market, if at all? Do you think this will have an impact on pre-sale investors? I have a great comment. Can I chime in? Please. It literally makes zero, zero difference. Um, so it like flip the flip, it was basically all CRA did was they made a clarification to how they're going to treat properties. So, but in, in most cases, properties were already treated as such. So if you had a history of flipping properties, you were already taxed as if it was a business income. So if, you know, if you just did one flip and, you know, you flip, you held a property for 11 months, you did one flip and that's your whole history of, of owning real estate, then you might've probably got away with a capital gains tax. But if you had actually had done like two flips, three flips, and you have a history of like buying and selling real estate, it was always taxed as business income. So nothing has changed. It's literally just government wrapping up this, this, thing to say, oh, look, we're going to come after the bad guys. We're coming after the property flippers. They literally did not change anything. They just made a clarification saying this is exactly how we're going to treat it. But in, in most cases, it was, it was already treated that way. Yeah, I find a lot of the government uh, rules, regulations that get introduced, they're really just uh, marketing ploys to say they're doing something. I got to chime in on that too, because I, 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 I do this like on the side as you know, we, I, so anyone that's doing property flipping, like, I'm not gonna say professionally, but like fairly regularly, let's say they do, let's say you do one a year, um, or one every couple of years, like anyone that's actually doing it at like a reasonable scale is, has been running it through a business corporation anyways. So you might see like a, a realtor, you know, teams up with a contractor and they have a company together and they, and they do property flips together. Like they're running that through a company. And so that's already taxes if it's business income. Right. So um, really what this is doing is actually more so targeting like mom and pop flippers, like people that again, don't have a lot of experience flipping property. Um, so it's, it's interesting because the tax is kind of the way they painted the tax was like, oh, we're getting the bad guys. But in reality, it's actually not going to change anything for people that we're doing at scale. What it's going to do is it's going to target the mom and pop that we're doing it very, very occasionally. Mm-hmm. Sorry to go on a rant there, but I thought it was... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, I, 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 just, I just short comment here too. I agree with what Steve said. Like, 
and, and like with my, I've done a couple of renov renovations as well. And it's the same thing. Like it doesn't change too much um, in terms of pre-sale. Uh, like if that, if that was talking about that, maybe you, you might see people hold on to it at completion a bit longer. I don't, I don't know, because like, some people might want to avoid perhaps paying um, and they want to hold it or rent it out instead of selling it right away. Uh, but again, I don't think that's going to have an impact on the general consumer. Um, it's just people just adjust their habits a little bit accordingly. Um, so I don't, is it going to make properties more affordable in Vancouver or pre-sales more affordable? No. Um, but is it going to change the habits of how people sell? Maybe they might wait a little bit longer and complete and rent it out. Yeah, maybe. Um, but again, it's not going to have an impact on, on pricing. It's again, like it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a show to look like, you know, you're doing something. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I don't think it's going to really have much of an impact on the general consumer. That, that's, that's, it's a good point to your pre-sale thing, because it's like, if you bought one pre-sale and then you flipped it like right at completion and that was your first time doing it, you're probably getting away with a capital gains tax. But like, once you do like your second, your, your CRA is probably flagging you at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, again, you can try to get away with it, but they can always come back to you years down the road. Right. So uh, like, you know, I, I think it's an important clarification that um, yeah, the CRA was kind of already handling a lot of these in that in that circumstance so good point I've had quite a few clients asking about uh, where's a good place to buy a, a rental property or potentially a rec property I know during the pandemic we saw this uh, exodus of people in the city out to the suburbs and and further beyond uh, I know many companies are mandating back to work now two or three days a week uh, are, have, have you seen uh, have you seen any opportunities um, you know you've got the Sunshine Coast you've got the Okanagan the, the island uh, where are people actually selling? Is there is there a surplus of uh, options elsewhere, uh, or are you still seeing people moving out of the city and there's high demand everywhere? Yeah, I mean, I think during I'll give a quick uh, thought here. I think during pandemic, the general trend was more space, uh, and I'm working from home, so let's move out from the city. And I think everybody was thinking that, especially in the age 25 to 40 years old. I think that was a lot of people kind of went moved out and got that space. Um, now, yeah, with the return to the office, like I haven't personally had a whole lot of people being like, let's sell the place we bought last year and buy back in, in the city again. Uh, but we're not really seeing as many people that are wanting to buy out there. A lot of people are okay with the urban lifestyle. Once again, going back downtown, um, we have clients that are looking at downtown again, which a year and a half or two years ago, people didn't want to touch downtown with a 10 foot pole. Um, so we are seeing more clients that are not necessarily selling their place and moving back to the city, but the, the clients that are looking to buy as, as first-time buyers now um, that don't only really have their roots tied anywhere, they're looking at somewhere close to work, maybe downtown. And um, yeah, it's, it's a great place to go. The Connects game was on last night. It's a great environment and people are really taking note of that. So we're definitely seeing more, again, the urban lifestyle is kind of becoming cool again. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that there's so many opportunities. I think people have to figure out like where they want to invest. Right. So uh, I, I think you can make any money in any market, but it's like, okay. I mean, I think first and foremost to figure out like where you actually want to own real estate. Like if, for example, if you want to own property in the Okanagan, um, are you prepared to self-manage remotely? Uh, if you're not, then you got to hire property management and pay them, you know, eight, nine, 10% management fees. So you have to factor that into your return. Um, so like I said, I think there's money to be made, whether that's, you know, the Okanagan, the Island, uh, different provinces across Canada, but it's all comes down to, um, you know, I think first and foremost, you have to ask yourself where, where do you actually want to own real estate? Yeah. It's not necessarily passive income, like your, uh, investment portfolio. So thinking through those things, real estate can be great, but, uh, it, it does come with headaches. You, you're, you're never going to get a call from, uh, uh, the, the, a stock that you own, but you, you will get a call from a tenant that's renting on one of your properties. Tired. Yeah. Good. Well, I mean, I got a point on that. I'm just, uh, I'm, I self manage, I own a bunch of real estate in Calgary. So I self manage that. I, I hire property managers to fill vacancies, uh, cause I'm not there, but I don't mind like fielding the odd call, but like, it's funny. Cause everybody was like, Oh, you should own like the best cap rates are in like Saskatchewan. 
And I was like, yeah, but I don't want to own and fly to Saskatchewan. Because like, even if you hire property management, the reality is they should, you should be checking up on your property at least once a year. Mm-hmm. So you have to ask yourself, it's like, well, do, do you, do you want to go there? And so I know like people, like we've got clients that own like Kelowna because like they like to go up to Kelowna every summer and like spend time there. And so, um, yeah, I think, like I said, to, to boil things down is, is where I enjoy flying to Calgary because it's an hour away and I make a little vacation out of it and I write it all off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also sure. you want to look Catch at Leafs, Leafs game over to you, Brian. <laughs> oh yeah, I was just yeah, kind of to Steve's point too. Like, uh, like Points. it is a personal decision um, where where you want to buy as much as we're about the numbers, but personal decision does factor into it as well. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I think like I, again, term, it might not always be just about the best numbers, uh, but uh, some that you can manage close to home. And I used to feel like, oh, I got to go out of this far away to buy the best possible property because the rental rates are great. And I, you know, we bought a bunch of stuff up north, which which is doing well. But we are noticing like, yeah, like you are, uh, this is up in Prince George and we're getting managers up there. There's not as much selection on who to hire. Um, so you gain, you do have a bit of dynamics to deal with and maybe a more cash flow intensive market. Uh, where Vancouver, you if you can if you're living here, it's a if it's a first time purchase, it's probably generally something you can drive to is is probably going to give you peace of mind. Um, but once you get that process kind of comfortable, with that process, you maybe want to get a little bit more creative, go a bit out of the city, and if you find the right opportunity. But that does come with a lot of hiring the right team out remotely, managers, contractors, um, and uh, it is a bit more of a step. So I'd say for a first investment, probably somewhere that you can drive to, but yeah, if you down the road, if that's something you want to do, then there's there's opportunities everywhere. Ryan, are you hiring out in P- in Prince George? Yes, yes, hired out in Prince George. So, did uh, you try self management, or did you go directly? We uh, we we started just with the manager to just to start. Uh, we just heard some uh, kind of stories from past tenants of the you know up there you do deal with some. It's a different tenant base, so tenant we would have someone that knew how to you know knew the knew the area. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting to hear you, you do a bit of a hybrid model. It sounds like with Calgary. So, yeah, well, it's funny. Cause I, w- I looked up at Prince George like years ago. Um, but I was like, I was like, I don't know, man, like even the flights there, they're not cheap. It's so not I- cheap. No. And that's the thing. <laughs> so you fly, you know, buy in Arizona, you fly Arizona. That's, it sounds like cool and it sounds fun and, and enjoyable Prince George. I mean, you can make a fun weekend out of it, but it's, it's not the same as because I'm going to another somewhere else where you might want to venture anyway. Um, I also owned in uh, Whistler previously as well. And that market did really well during COVID. Um, the prices went up probably like 30, 40% in one year, which was insane. Um, ended up selling it last year, um, which the timing was was good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, that was a great market too. Would I, would I buy there right now? I might be a little bit more cautious. As, you, as I said, with recessions, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, these... It, it was nice having a property there, not going to lie. Like you stay in your own Airbnb or you, you, you have your own space to go up there and you you might want to go up anyways and you now you take care of it. So that was, I do miss it at times. Um, and uh, maybe one day uh, there'll be an opportunity to come up there again. Yeah. We've got a few questions lined up here. So let's try to fire through them. Uh, first one's over to Steve. Uh, can you comment on the future of uh, real estate in Calgary? Any insights? <laughs> um. I think that uh, I think that the long run thesis is that I think um, I think that housing in Vancouver and Toronto is is going to continue to be unaffordable. I think yeah, you know we're going through a correction. We've had it. Maybe things are bottoming. Maybe they're not. But even if there's more of a correction here, the re- the reality is it's still going to be a very unaffordable housing market uh, for the next decade easily. Um, and so I think people are going to continue to migrate due to like lifestyle, uh, which is, you might not want to move to Calgary. It might not be your first choice, but if you want a family in a detached house with a picket fence, um, you know, for half a million bucks, that's, that's where you got to go. So, um, I think that they've got a young, young workforce. I think that there's a lot more that's happening just besides oil and gas. And I'm super optimistic on the energy sector, uh, due to the underinvestment in that space uh, over the last 10 years. So um, yeah, it's not a market that you're going to see the kind of price appreciation like you do in uh, in Vancouver and the GTA because there's not there's not really supply constraints per se. 
but I think that, uh, you know, it should be a pretty stable housing market. And that's what we're seeing right now is, you know, while the rest of the country is down 10, 15, 20%, uh, that's, that market is actually up uh, year over year. So. Yeah, I don't know you called that one early, so good on you for that. Uh, another question here, uh, it's more of a comment, I think, but population growth, high median salaries, low vacancy rental rates, what other factors would you add to this to dictate whether real estate's a good or a bad investment? Sound like a pretty good list already there. What, what was it? Was it the high, the, maybe one more time? Population growth, high median salaries, low vacancy rental rates. Like yeah. the things I would add to that list would be time. So real estate isn't, isn't, uh, isn't free from a time perspective. So if you think of other potential investments that are legitimately passive, that's a, a negative side of it. But uh, you get a discount on mortgages compared to any other debt. If you're borrowing money from a bank to start a business, you're not going to get the same rate you will on a mortgage. It doesn't feel like it today because rates are so high. But comparatively, um, mortgages are, are basically, uh, you're, you're incentivized to buy them by, by government and banks. Uh, they, they, they want you to buy housing. So therefore, well, you know, why fight them on that principal residence tax exemption? There's another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, population growth too. It, it's a good metric, but also just general pop, just the number of population. If it's a town of 10,000 and it grows to 15,000, that's 50% population growth, but it doesn't necessarily mean it could be maybe a boom and bust town. So, I mean, maybe you want to have a criteria saying I only invest in towns with at least 50 to 100,000 people, maybe, for example, as a minimum. Um, that could be something to look at. You have a good base of uh, professionals there that you can rely on. Um, and uh, yeah, and also maybe personal distance and how far you want to travel as, as you know, we were chatting about together. That could be another criteria piece uh, is how far are you willing to travel for this as well? Like, do you want something in your backyard or somewhere you're okay with flying or getting in the car for a few hours? Um, Did you miss any, Steve? No, I think you got them all. All right, uh, Carlos got another one here. How do you deal with bad tenants? And how bad did it get RTV level? I'm not sure what he means there. Yeah. I should add that Alberta doesn't really have much restriction. Yeah, I've dealt with that in Prince George already. Um, like, yeah, the tenants up in, in the end, different markets, I think up there, you, you, that does come up. Uh, yeah, it, it took a few months uh, to actually go through the process. But again, this is where I, I was happy to have a manager on my side. Um, that was able to go through the process, the paperwork, um, and we ended up recovering about half the rent over those three months that we were owed. And it was a fourplex, so that was one of the four units that wasn't paying, so it wasn't like the whole property wasn't paying. We were still able to afford our mortgage payments and more with the three units. Uh, but yeah, it took about three months uh, to deal with that. And again, the manager was pretty key, um, especially going, just dealing with the paperwork and make sure you show up on time. Um, so yeah, that was nice to have that, especially being so far away. Are there any tools you guys use to help filter through tenants or help make it uh, easier to, to manage? Ryan, you go ahead. I don't, I'm, I'm not a, I, I, I'm not great at it. I just, uh, I know my skill set, So I just, hi, I hire that out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I get help with it too. I know my parents did rental management for many years. So I know my, uh, you know, my mother always said, make sure that you get screenshots of their, you know, you want to make sure they have three months of rental payments in the bank, like in case they get laid off or you want to know you can collect still collect rent, um, doing your proper reference checks, uh, calling their employer, um, calling their past landlords. Um, ask the landlord, would you rent to them again? Because maybe they feel uncomfortable giving a bad reference. But if you ask them where they rent again, they can be a little more honest, say, uh, maybe I wouldn't, or yeah, I would for sure. Um, social media, uh, we always like, we're looking to rent out of our own place here. And, we're, and then uh, my fiance is going on social media. She knows they don't have any social media accounts and they're 20, which might be a bit of a red flag. Um, so yeah, definitely creep their social media, see, cause that, that's where you can get a true indication of who the, who they are. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to go the extra mile credit score as well, uh, but some people don't feel comfortable with that, but there's free res resources online. Um, I've asked tenants to send me a screenshot of their credit karma score and you see that, but that's kind of an extra step. But I think those three re references, social media and bank statements are probably the main three there. It sounds like we haven't had any uh, 
any situations that were too bad yet, but uh, hopefully that stays the same. I've been pretty lucky so far. Uh, anyone that I've rented to has been generally a nice person who I actually would, would enjoy having a beer with. So uh, hopefully that stays uh, the same moving forward. Um, next one here coming from uh, Aldridge. Uh, what's the secret to increasing the rent in Vancouver amicably as a landlord? When rent increase is capped at 2%, everything obviously is going up by a lot more than that. Steve, you can go. Ryan, I, I mean, I'll give you an update. I had a client that uh, I don't think he raised the rent for like six or seven years. Um, and then he was on like a floating payment variable mortgage. So his like his payment started going up and he's like, oh crap. And so obviously he went from like being positive, whatever, three, 400 bucks a month to all of a sudden he's losing like two, 300 bucks a month. And so, um, you know, he just basically had a conversation with the tenant and said, listen, um, oh, my lights went out. Uh, he just had a conversation with the tenants and just said, listen, I'm going to, uh, I, I, I'm going to have to move in. This is the situation with my mortgage. I need to, I'm going to move into this unit myself or I am going to sell it. And so you'll have to leave um, most likely, or, or we can renegotiate the, 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 ten, the, the agreement. So he was basically just upfront and just said, this is the situation I'm in financially. Um, and the tenant said, okay, well, like I, I've been here for seven years. I want to stay. And they basically signed a brand new lease um, that was higher than obviously the 2% increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Um, yeah, it's like that, that's definitely an option. You could always, if you need to move in and you, you need to make those, like you need a place to live and the payments are going up. Um, definitely uh, an option there. Um, another one I'd add is if ideally you don't have to even um, go to them for a raise in the sense of that's like basically, uh, that's why I like furnished rentals, one bedrooms, because you ideally just want the tenant to leave on their own and then you don't have to be the one to put the raise because once they leave, you can put the rent to the market rent or, rent or uh, wherever it is. So, you know, we like, you know, one bedrooms because often you have someone that comes in as a for a year as a working professional, they move out on their own. Um, or you do a furnished rental, they pay a bit of a premium. They're not in their long term. They don't want to pay 25% premium. They're going to find another place eventually uh, that they're going to settle into long term. Um, so you, in Vancouver, in a low vacancy market, you actually don't mind turnover um, because once you get turnover, it's actually like a, a positive because it's so low vacancy. So that that's why, uh, yeah, I'd say almost those one beds do well or furnished rentals are nice too. Um, so you don't have to be the one to have a, yeah, do any, yeah, go, go, go back to them for an increase because you can do it naturally. Definitely. Yeah. Good advice there. We of course aren't looking to gouge people, but hopefully we can cover our costs that continue to increase. Uh, now uh, we're coming to the top of the hour here. So just want to uh, thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, a special thanks of course, to Steve and Ryan for sharing uh, their time and expertise. I know this is a bit of a choppy market and it's a tough place to be buying, selling uh, real estate or any investment assets. If um, we didn't answer your question today, I know Sarah, we missed yours. Feel free to connect with us on uh, LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd be happy to uh, continue to field questions. Everyone will get a recording after the event. Uh, but yeah, other than that, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Stephen Ryan. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. See you guys.